here we are and we have a new guest <laughs> welcome doug <laughs> welcome to the show um thank you very we... much <laughs> i can see from your from your tagline that you're something to do with amazon code whisperer but you know for the benefit of our audience please tell everyone who you are and, and what you do at aws i would love to but first before i do uh, two things really important one i appreciate being the headlining act had all the openers <laughs> now we're here love that secondly with aaron brian stephanie uh, Suzanne, Gotti, everybody's in black. I want Steve. I want you to feel some camaraderie. So here I am in gray with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and then anyway, the headlining up. act. You have your musical instruments in the back. So yeah, we're ready. Yes, we're ready. If things go off the rails, we'll just jam. We'll just jam. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> back to back to your actual question. What uh, what is Code Whisper? Um, Code Whisper is uh, Susan was Suzanne was talking about this earlier. Code Whisper is uh, your AI coding companion. That's you know in a nutshell, that's what it is. If we were going to sit down and and build an app together, we would maybe do some pair programming. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd bring some knowledge into it. I'd bring some knowledge into it. We'd both contribute to the to the code, and we'd come up with something amazing. Um, code Whisper provides that without having to look for someone to do it with. It's there all Does the time. It's available in IDE. <laughs> What's that? I said he does it in silence. I've done peer programming. It's quite, quite, in, quite interesting way of doing it. Uh, but this yeah. does it in silence. There's nobody chirping in your ear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yes, for sure. It's, it's it, the great thing about it is it's this ambient kind of experience when you're working in your development environment. Let's say I'm working in VS Code or I'm working in JetBrains, Python, whatever it is. Um, Code Whisper is just present there ambiently. I don't have to interact with it per se. In other words, I don't have to click a button. I don't have to find a menu item. I don't have to do anything like that. It's just there paying attention to what I'm doing, looking at the comments I'm writing, look at the, looking at the code I'm writing. And then from there, it's making inferences about what I need to do. What am, what am I trying to accomplish? What do I want to do next? And then providing suggestions uh, about the code that I might need. And if I like the suggestion, just like we were pair program, I'm like, hey, that's a good idea, Steve. I take that suggestion. And I, I didn't on. hear that very often when I was pair program. <laughs> I mean, what I meant to say was that's a great idea, Aaron. I'll go ahead and take that code. Well, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and defend Code Whisper and say, Steve, if you were to handwrite the code, you might still not hear that's a great idea. But you can take Code Whisper's idea and take full credit for it, Steve. I'll give you permission for that. I could do that. Yes. Yes. You can. In fact, that's actually one of the things we talk about is uh, we Code Whisper is providing suggestions based on your context. So it's based on your code. It's based on what you're writing which means the suggestion, the code that comes out is also yours. It's yours to do mm -hmm. with as you please, you own it, uh, it's yours. So, so instead of trying to write documentation or instead of trying to write the code firsthand and then struggling through it and getting a whole lot of errors, I can reduce the error rate most likely because it's looking at my code and it's also referencing our public documentation and our code samples that are trusted, right? Correct. Code Whisper is, you know, we, we've been talking about generative AI all morning. Code Whisper is a large language model. It's a generative AI model. Um, mm -hmm. It's trained on billions of lines of code. This is uh, open source code, as well as code that we provided to the model to ensure that it really understands not just how to code uh, generally, but also how to code for AWS. So um, you can use it for anything. You can, you can code with it to build any kind of app you want. And if you're building for AWS, it's fantastic. So just to be clear for everybody, this is not Code Whisperer doesn't just generate code for <clears throat> working with AWS services. You can use this completely, even if you're not working with AWS. Correct. Not only can you use it uh, to build any app, even if it has nothing to do with AWS, uh, you don't even need an AWS account to use it. Uh, so one of the things we announced yesterday with Code Whisperer is, so this had been in preview for a while and we said, okay, now it's generally available. And as part of the general availability, we said, we're gonna have two tiers. There's an individual tier and there's a professional tier. The individual tier is free. Suzanne mentioned this earlier. Uh, you can go get it. It's an extension into your IDE. You just install the, uh, it's part of the AWS toolkit. So you install the AWS toolkit, Code Whisper is there. You create what's called an AWS builder ID, which is essentially just registering an email address and password. And that's how you authenticate to Code Whisper. And then you get all of the code generation capabilities and all the different things that Code Whisper does um, without ever having to give up credit card or do anything. And it's it's not time limited, it's free. Just keeps going. Perpetual. Yeah. Yep, yeah. exactly. And, and then the pro version. Knows best. Um, yeah, the pro version adds some extra 
advantage for organizations that are rolling Code Whisper out to, to their entire teams, where they have the ability to tie into single sign-on through IAM Identity Center. They have the ability to um, do some policy management over how things like, for example, licensed uh, open source code is used within Code Whisper and things like that. So before we move on, you mentioned AWS toolkits there. So I guess for the benefit of the, of the audience, we maybe should quickly summarize the languages that it supports today. Because I know that when it was uh, when GA yesterday, you know, we announced additional language support and Correct. the IDEs that people can use this in. So could you briefly just summarize those? Yeah, I always feel like this is like, you know, you go to school and there's like a pop quiz, like name all 15, ready, go. <laughs> Um, I won't call so, you out if you miss one. It's okay. <laughs> I always feel like I'm doing some language a disservice when I forget. I forgot uh, I forgot to mention C and C++ the other day, and I was like, oh, somebody oh. who loves that language is going to be so mad at me. Um, but <laughs> so we had we had uh, we already had support for Python, Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, and C sharp. Those five. I'm not going to get mad at you because you just mentioned C sharp. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we already had all those. So then here we go. Here's what we added. Right. We added. Kotlin, Ruby, PHP, uh, Scala, C, C++, Shell Script, SQL, Go, and Rust. I think you got them all. I think I did them all. You got them all. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And then in terms of like, okay, so those are the languages. Now, where can I use them? Yes. Um, We're we're in the AWS toolkit, and we're we're available in Visual Studio Code. So VS Code is hugely popular. People can use it there. Um, we're available in the entire family of JetBrains IDEs. So if you're using you know, GoLand or you're using IntelliJ, uh, we're available there. And then as well as um, some of the AWS uh, places. So like uh, Cloud9, AWS Cloud9 integrated there and in uh, the Lambda console integrated there. And I see the chat messages popping up and there's one that caught my eye. Uh, they said, pretty disappointed. They were hoping Doug would whisper. <laughs> well, let me just clear the air about this because if I whisper too much, I sound like somebody's creepy. Uh, so let me clear the air. A whisper, aside from being somebody who talks really quietly, a whisper is somebody who can, through their voice and body language, tame a wild beast. And code mm-hmm. is a wild beast. It's so a wild code beast. whisper yeah. helps you tame that code. Yeah, yeah. We've just had one great technical question on the on the chat i'm going to throw this up before we carry on but sure. um we've been talking to all day on on this show well not all day obviously but the, but the last hour and a half on this show latency demos right we've had a few mm-hmm. glitches in, in the a few. <laughs> yeah so how yeah. does so a question from hostet how does code whisper handle network latency and bandwidth limitations Can yeah so that? i mean like any cloud service you're you're at the mercy of the network and so there, there's always going to be some uh uh, concern you have to have there. Clearly, the, the better your network connection, the, 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 the closer better. you are to where it's providing the service, the faster it's going to be. What's more interesting is what, you know, the, the challenge with large language models, foundation models, the things we've been talking about all day, um, has to do with, you know, the trade-offs between the, the models and the performance of the model. So really big models can do a, a lot of stuff. You know, I can, I can write a poem about the software that I'm writing in the voice of a pirate and create all this cool stuff. Um, or I can have something that's really fit for purpose. So it's like, hey, this is about code generation. I'm gonna, it, it understands natural language. It understands uh, you know, how to convert that intent into code, but it's really specific around code generation, which enables us to sort of compress the model down a little bit, have it really fit for purpose, really focused, and that makes it faster. And so now, instead of uh, like an interface where I'm gonna ask a question like, oh, how do I you know, do this task and wait and get a response like a second or two later, um, it can actually work in real time within the IDE. And as I'm typing, it's really responsive and telling me what uh, what I can do. Hmm. We also had another question about IDEs. Um, somebody joined late. Um, is Code Whisper enabled in Cloud9 automatically? Yeah, yeah so Cloud9 is VS Code and JetBrains, but what about Cloud9? Yeah, yeah Cloud9, Code Whisper, think of it as a new feature of Cloud9. Uh, so it's built into Cloud9. You can enable Code Whisper and start using it. Same with Lambda Console. It's built in there, and you can start using it. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. That's a that's a whole yeah, lot I'm of information about goal, Code Whisper. My hope is, yeah, my hope is that we can have Code Whisper wherever you are. Like it, we're going to meet you where you are. Um, that's those are the places we have, and I'm sure somebody's going to come up with a, you know, some place. Everybody always wants to know when we're going to have Code Whisper and BIM, and all it really needs to do is know how to exit. That's probably all it has to be able to do. Does that? Mm. Pretty cool. 
So a whole lot of talk about Code Whisperer. Um, we've talked about generative AI and what that is. But... One. I just thought of one very important one, actually, before we move on, Aaron, that we forgot, I think. It's also in the Lambda console. Oh. Correct. Is Yeah, okay. Yeah. I have a lot of exploring to do. I just remember from the yeah. news blog post, it's in the Lambda console as well. It is in the Lambda here's console. One, here's one. Here's another question for you. So we talked about like authentication. Can I use my existing mm -hmm. IAM credentials? So Code Whisper gives you two ways to authenticate. One is, as I mentioned, with AWS Builder ID, and that mm -hmm. gives you access to Code Whisper Individual, completely free, does everything you want it to do. And we can talk about the differences. And then the other way to authenticate with Code Whisper is through the IAM Identity Center. So not your typical IAM credentials, but set up IAM Identity okay. Center, create users, create groups, authorize those users and groups to the Code Whisper application, and then they get access to it. And that's considered our pro tier. So that's where you're, us you're using the pro tier. It's $19 per user per month based on who Got has it. access to the tool. And if um, you don't do that, then it's free. Correct. And then the, the big difference is for organizations who want some of that oversight uh, around who has access to it, around whether or not they're um, enabled to have open source, re open source references, which I'll show you here in a second, um, and the idea about whether or not they're willing to share their prompts and their suggestions with us to help us learn and, and train the model. Mm -hmm. um, in the individual tier, we have this opt out option. You can go into the settings and say, I don't want to share my code for the purposes of training the model. Clearly, the code has to go to the model to do the inferencing. But if you don't want to share your code, um, you can go opt out of that. At the pro tier, we just won't, we make the assumption you don't want that. You're already opted Got out. It. You're not, we're not going to share, uh, we're not going to train the model from the code coming from the pro tier. Just to make sure I heard that right, free is opt in already, and then you need to opt out through settings. Correct. And then the enterprise level for $19 per user per month, and you can have SSO integration, but essentially assuming a role instead of using credentials. Um, that is by default opt out, but they can opt in if they want to. They cannot opt in actually. We will just not no. use their code for training the model. Okay, okay, good to know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Really good to know. Um, so, so just some of the differences between the two tiers. But uh, Code Whisper is super cool to talk about. It's way cooler to show. So if you'll indulge yes. me. Yes. We, we uh, love us some demos on this show. So we will indulge you as long as yeah. you like. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like Alexa earlier. My wake word is free. Steve's is demo. Nice. <laughs> uh, have ID, you will travel. OK, so here I am. I'm in VS Code. Um, and just to, to, to kind of show you this, the, the way you get Code Whisper is through the AWS Toolkit. You'll notice right in the tagline, including support for Code Whisper. Um, mm -hmm. So you install the AWS Toolkit. Make sure you have the most up-to-date version uh, uh, to get the, the new release. And that's free too, right? Just so everybody Yeah, knows. the toolkit's free. Uh, everything yeah. that you, you go in there is free. Now, the services you use may cost you some may money. May cost you. Um, Code Whisper is one that. Uh, may not depend on how you're using it. So you install the AWS toolkit. I've got that installed. You see it here on the sidebar. You'll see Code Whisper showing up down below. Um, and you'll notice it says, for me, I've connected with my AWS Builder ID. So I've already created my Builder ID and I've already connected. Uh, this is a, a relatively simple thing to do. I can go in and say, I want to connect with my Builder ID or I want to connect using IAM Identity Center. You'll notice IAM credentials says not supported by Code Whisper. So I'm connected with Builder ID, which means what? It means I'm using Code Whisper Individual. It's completely free. Everything I'm doing today is what I can do with the free product. As soon as I enable it, you'll see that um, where, where it says pause auto suggestions would have said start before. So I click start, I log in. Now it's turned on. So auto suggestions are enabled. So as I'm working, it's paying attention to what I'm doing and it's gonna make suggestions for what I'm doing. We're gonna talk about security scans. We're gonna talk about reference log. We'll come back to those uh, in just a minute. So let's take a look at what it does. My favorite thing is to show you the value of Code Whisper in about 10 seconds. And so I'm going to open up a Node.js file. Uh, I've got a song parser.js. I've already got a comment in here that says I want to parse a CSV string of songs. I want to return a list. I want to ignore lines with a, with a hashtag. As soon as I hit enter, down at the bottom, you see a little Code Whisper spinning icon. That means that oh, yeah. it's talking to the service, and it's sending up that context. It's getting an inference, and it's coming back and saying, here's, here's the code. Done. I can move on. I wrote that code. You just accept that code. That's that's pretty quick. You just said yeah. you wrote that code, but the service wrote it. Well, but you, nobody has to know that. Okay. It's so my you, code you now. No one has to know that. No one has to. No, that's very true. But I'm kind of curious that you know when that when that code came up, it was kind of semi-ghosted out, right? It hadn't yet been Correct. accepted. 
So what did you actually hit to accept that code? Yeah, so I'm gonna do it again and it's gonna do the same inferencing. The context hasn't changed, so I should get right. the same recommendation. The same. If I change the context, I might get something different. So we see this sort of like faded out ghost yeah. text saying, here's a suggestion. And in fact, we uh, Code Whisperer will deliver multiple suggestions to you. So if you don't like the first one, you can kind of scroll through and look at other ones. And I can use my arrow key to do that. So if I tap my arrow key, I can see different suggestions. They're all variations of the same thing. Cause again, it's from the context. So it's like more stylistic in, in nature than anything right. else. Um, so I can kind of scroll through. I'm gonna go back to the first one. If, if let's say I like the first one, I just hit the tab key and I'm oh, done. Okay. I'm moving on to the next thing. That's it. Nice. Simple as that. And this is a great example. This The reason I like this is, example is it's a really simple example of like, oh, you're just parsing CSV. How hard is that? But like how many times do you go, yeah, I know how to do that. Wait, what's the syntax again? Oh, do I have to do this? Uh, you know what? I've just spent it? some time writing an app for doing some internal CSV parsing. It's not that simple. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, and let me show you. Let me show you the same example in a different language. Um, so I'm going to use uh, Java. So I've got the same thing. I've got a song parser mm -hmm. Java class. Same comment. I didn't change the comment at all. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, trigger Code Whisper. So it says, "Okay, do you want a chart parser class?" Because it oh. sees I've got original chart date things like that. Yeah. I hit the tab key, or excuse me, hit the arrow key, and it looks at the file name. It says, "Oh, song parser is the file name. That's that's probably a better class name." So I'm going to accept that. Go to the next line. Code Whisper thinks about it and says, okay, you're creating a class called Song Parser. You probably need a, a static method called parse, takes a CSV file and returns a list of songs. And you'll notice there's a little line at the top right in between class and the suggestion that says, if you accept hmm. import java.util.list and one other import will also be added. And then there's a, and also reference code under Apache 2.0. Uh, yes. view the full details in the code whisper reference log. So this is really interesting because it's telling me a couple things and I can look at this and again, I can choose with my arrow keys, I can move around and choose different suggestions and it might come up with uh, different things. In this case, it's just all it's doing is changing the, for the most part, the method signature. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna keep the first example. I'm gonna click tab and you'll notice the two imports got added mm -hmm. and a bunch of code got added, but it, it, start, it referenced a class that doesn't exist. Song. That's the song class, right? Yeah. The song, song class type. doesn't exist. So I'm just going to hit enter a couple of times and then I can trigger Code Whisper manually. I can say, hey, I, I'm ready for a suggestion. And, you know, in this case, there was no reason for it to trigger because I didn't do something. So I'm going to hit, op I'm going to max, I'm going to hit option C and that triggers Code Whisper. It says, oh, well, looking at the context, you also need a song class. So I'm going to go ahead and accept that comment. And then it's going to think about it and say, okay, well, let's create a song class tab. So there we go, now we have a song class. Now my code is, is, is good. But if you remember, when we accepted the class for song parser, it told us there was a reference code suggestion. Mm -hmm. So what I can yes. do is go back to- I was ask you about that. What does that mean? Go back to my sidebar and open up my code reference log. And what this means is when we formulated the suggestion for the code, we um, part of the post-processing, once the, once the language model creates the suggestion, we look at the suggestion and we compare it to our training data and say, oh, actually, there's something here that has a significant um, match to some known training data. And mm -hmm. in this case, we have, uh, we have this songs.add, new song, so on and so forth, with, uh, is, a, is a reference under Apache 2. So this is, this is code that looks a lot like an open source project that is under an Apache 2 license. And there's a link to that project, which is part of a, a GitHub project that I can go link to. So I can click the link and go to that GitHub project and take a look at it. And the reason for doing this is Code Whisper is trained on so much code and it's, it's publicly available open source code, as well as, like I said, the, the, the code that we provided to understand uh, Amazon, you know, AWS APIs. And so it's very possible when it's thinking about the code that you need and formulating the code you need, that it can create something that looks a lot like some open source code that it understands. This would be the same as, you know, let's say Aaron, you and I were working on an app together and you were like, hey, I know I've seen this before. There's this open source code that we can use. We can just go copy and paste from there. And you go, okay, cool, we'll do that. But we should then understand the license implications, right. know if we have to attribute the code in some way or do something with it. And so this is doing the same thing. It's saying, hey, I, I know this code. I've seen it somewhere else. Let me tell you where it is. Then you can go look at that code and look at that license and see if there's something you have to do there. Uh, and in this case, it's the song.add. If I mouse over it, it tells me what it is and you know what I want to do with it. 
Um, and it also tells me here it's reference code under Apache 2. So it's showing me the same thing that's in the reference log. Um, the nice thing about this is we, because we track it in the reference log, I don't have to stop what I'm doing and go look. I can just be like, cool, I'm going to take it. I'm going to keep going. I'm in the flow. I'm in the zone. I'm writing my code and we'll log all these things. And then I can go back later before I do my, my commit and I can be like, oh, let me, let me check those things out. Let me make sure I've attributed everything correctly and done what I want. You talked about logging no, no. other things too, but I, I imagine we could probably use Code Whisperer also to maybe create CloudWatch alerts and reports. And by the way, we were whispered that question mm -hmm. from the chat. So, yes. so right now today, Code Whisperer is primarily designed around application development. We will be adding support for infrastructure as code and some other things, you know, in the CDK and stuff like that. So that's coming, um, but it's really right now focused around application development. Um, and, and so far, you've seen me do some pretty generic stuff. And by the way, what I what I, I, I want to add, um, we 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 accepted an open source code reference. Um, but if you don't want an open source code reference, you're like, hey, I'm never going to accept code with an open source reference. Don't give it to me. I can come into the uh, settings for Code Whisperer, and there's an option to include suggestions with code references. I just uncheck it, and I won't get any code references that have an open source licensed reference. So, so yeah, will it? Will it? In that, in that particular case, will it just not show you those? It, yeah, we will filter them out from the suggestion, okay. so uh, you won't get those suggestions. So there's no. There's no way I can like accidentally sure. include a reference to something that's right. If we get a, if we if we if we create a suggestion that matches an open source repo, we'll filter that out if this is unchecked. Right. And this is okay. one of the reasons why the professional version is really interesting for organizations is this becomes an administrative setting. I go into the console and wow. I can I can set this as a policy for my entire organization versus at, at the individual tier, it's developer by developer. You have to ask people to go turn it on or turn right. it off. Right. Um, so that's okay. really important. All right, so that's some pretty cool stuff it does. Now, um, if you'll indulge me just a little bit more. There's more. There's a, there's a yes. wait. There's more coming. Oh, wait. Well, there's more, yeah. <laughs> wait, oh, wait, there's more. We haven't talked about AWS APIs yet. And yeah, so not. <laughs> uh, I've got another example here. And this is one that I, I like this example because um, it, it's kind of interesting and kind of fun um, in terms of, of how we go through this. So I've got a, a, a much more complicated uh, comment. Now, Code Whisper doesn't just work off comments. That's one of the ways it works, as I, I describe what I want to accomplish, and it'll give me that code. Um, but it'll also work as I'm coding. So as I'm typing a line of code, it'll think about what I need, and it'll suggest the finish of the, the rest of that statement, or it'll, you know, I'll type a function signature, and it'll suggest the body of that function. So it doesn't just have to be comments. It's also while I'm coding. Hmm. Um, but in this case, I've got a, a little bit more complex suggest or um, intent and I'm referencing a DynamoDB table. So clearly I'm using AWS here, um, still in uh, a Node.js app in this case. And so hit enter, that triggers Code Whisperer and it looks at that and says, oh, DynamoDB, well, that's AWS. You need the AWS SDK. You need the SDK, okay. Sure, sure enough, I do. Um, it's DynamoDB, so you need the DynamoDB yeah. document line. Okay, that seems reasonable. Um, it wants me to put the table name in an environment variable. That's an option. I'm not going to do that. I don't want, like, I can look at that and go, yeah, that's not a suggestion I want. So I'm just going to new line a couple of times and move down. And it's like, okay, cool. You're, you're done with constants. Let's get into uh, the method. And so it suggests an async uh, event handler. So I'm like, cool. You take that. And then it says, okay, based on what you've described, we're going to go ahead and create this method. And there's, you know, again, there's options. I can scroll through and see the options. Um, but in this case, I'm going to take this first one and boom, I'm done. Just like that, 29, well, 25 lines of code or whatever it is. Uh, mm. I finished that. However, the astute pair programmer is going to look at this and go, hey, Doug, that's cool. You hard coded the season in the episode. Like yeah. it's only going to ever do season two and only ever episode or after episode nine. And that's because that's what I described I want to do. I told Code Whisperer that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I go, well, uh, shoot, okay. I didn't describe what I wanted. This is one of the things we find is you kind of learn like, oh, I've got to be, I've got to be a little bit more explicit about what I want because it's going to do exactly what I want it to do. So instead was, of that was actually extremely subtle. I hadn't actually yeah. noticed that season two past episode <laughs> nine part. Exactly, exactly. And you know, 
this could be I copied and pasted the the you know maybe I copied this from like my product manager gave me an example mm -hmm. use case. I was like, okay, cool, I'll paste that in. But then I realized, oh, actually, I want not the second. I want this to be the um, specified season uh, episodes past, not episode nine, but past. Um, let's call it the. Will you specify it again? Specified episode. Get rid of nine. So now I've changed it to be a little bit more generic. Well, now I want I want a specified episode past a specified episode. Continuous specified device. phrase. So now I've gotten rid of these uh, sort of things. So then Code Whisper thinks about it and the context hasn't changed. It's still DynamoDB. So it's like, okay, it has SDK, that's cool. DynamoDB client, that's cool. It really likes those environment variables, but I don't. So I'm gonna move past that, get my async event handler. And then it suggests some code that's very similar to the code I had before, except now because it's a Node.js app, it goes, oh, you want to provide those as variables because you're specifying them. So we're gonna take those in as query string parameters. And then now I can change the use case. And so it's really about the context that's being provided to Code Whisper. Mm -hmm. it, it can do a lot of things. And it does a lot of things that are just sort of generic, like Node.js code or Rust code or Go or whatever. And it understands AWS well enough to do AWS specific things. Right. Understanding the intent and whatever that might be. And then as I go, you know, as I code and I do things, it's gonna, uh, help me. It's going to, you know, finish the statement for me. It's going to fill in a, a block for me or do some other things. And so that's some pretty cool stuff uh, that it does. So we've seen we've seen auto suggestions and we've seen the reference log, but we haven't seen the security scan yet. So I'm yeah, super <laughs> excited to show you that. But I'm going to stop my screen sharing for a second. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm going to do that is because this particular project is really just a hodgepodge of stuff. Um, so I don't want to uh, uh, do the security scan there. I want to use uh, something that's a little bit more lively, if you if you will. So let me share a different project. When you say live, well, you, it has security issues. <laughs> well, so um, our good friends in Code Guru have published some open source examples of really bad code that they can <laughs> that they use to show how Code Guru can look for security vulnerabilities. <laughs> and we actually partner with Code Guru to leverage some of the technology that they have and how we do this. And so this is a great example. I pulled this down from GitHub. This is a um, I'm in IntelliJ uh, this time. I'm working in Python. This is um, the Code Code Guru project. So it's a lot of it's a lot of examples of bad code. So I I've opened up a code injection file. You can kind of open up anything you want, I guess. Um, but so I've got a project. So the idea behind code scanning is Code Whisper is going to make suggestions, and hopefully it's right a lot. And you're like, cool. I'm going to take that suggestion. I'm just going to go with it. And then I'm maybe going to add some of my own code, or maybe I'm going to edit the suggestion a little bit. And then what you end up with is a hybrid of code that was suggested by Code Whisper and code that you contributed. Uh, All code that you found and, on a forum somewhere. Well, hopefully you, that's right. you know, hopefully you don't have to go looking on forums anymore. Right? Hopefully you don't Code Whisper is going to do that for you. Like we do, my right? hope is, I, I've I've spent a lot of time in developer productivity tools, and one of the things that that we all strive for as developers is like the more I can just kind of stay in the IDE and stay focused mm -hmm. on what I'm doing, the better. So anytime I have to go off the documentation or go off to that's a forum, right? that's yeah. disruptive. So, you know, let's hope you don't have to do that anymore and you're getting it all from, from Code Whisper and then you're augmenting that. But from a responsibility standpoint, I can't, uh, I don't, I don't feel good if I'm saying, Hey, here's some code that we're suggesting. You're going to augment and do some stuff with it and, you know, cross your fingers and hope it's great. And so we wanted to build in some tools to help you before you commit your code, uh, that you can run some security scans against that code and look for any known vulnerabilities that might exist. This is the one aspect of Code Whisper that's not ambient. And what I mean by that is you have to ex explicitly perform a gesture to go make this happen, whereas everything else just sort of happens as you're working. Okay. And so if I if I'm at a point in time where I'm like, okay, now is a good time to run a security scan, I go over to the AWS Toolkit, and under Code Whisper, there's Run a Security Scan. I'm gonna go ahead and double click that. And it's going to run. Now, this is a little bit of a, of a bigger project. And so it's going to take a, a, I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute to run while it runs that security scan, leveraging some of that code guru, um, code reviewer technology uh, and looking for these known security vulnerabilities. And again, this is on not just the Code Whisper code, but the entire project. So even code that might have been there before you had Code Whisper, then you started using Code Whisper. And then uh, anything you added to it. So then it comes back. Yeah, in this case, we back have... to the to my point about you know it could be code that we copied in from a forum somewhere, right? It could be yes, Previously. yes, exactly. So we've got uh, eighty three files or seventy four issues found. We can sort of randomly pick one. So 
Um, insecure cryptography sounds kind of exciting. Ooh, that sounds bad. Um, so we've got <laughs> we've got uh, insecure cryptography, uh, misuse of crypto, uh, cryptographic uh, related APIs. So I can click on that. It opens up that file. It takes yeah. me right to where this problem is, and it tells me uh, what's happening there. And so it gives me the opportunity to understand what the issue might be and understand what I might have to go do about it. And then, you know, whether or not it, it, the, the, this, this project is intentionally designed to have a lot of problems, so you would probably hopefully not have a real project like this. But um, then you could start using Code Whisperer to do cool things, you know, and say, okay, well, I want to do something. So it's going to start suggesting um, different ways of solving the problem that you might want to. So here, like, oh, it's telling us we have a known, a known weakness, which is great. It's actually informing us. But it gives you different ways of doing this, including how we might want to solve the problem. Um, and so that's sort of part of the example of how this code can work. So the idea then that I'm using Code Whisper, it's suggesting code to me. Uh, I'm, I'm moving faster. I'm getting more done. I'm enjoying my life more because I'm not having to do all the mundane stuff all the time. I'm staying in my IDE, right? I'm staying I'm in my zone. I'm bother like, a colleague or go and search some forum somewhere. Exactly. Exactly. And then when I want to, I can run that security scan and see what, what's going on and what happens there. And that is, by the way, this is one of the only feature differences between individual and professional, which is at the individual tier for free, I can run 50 code scans a month per developer. Okay. Um, that's more than one a day. Most developers probably aren't going to do that, but some might. Yeah. Um, at the pro tier, I can run 500 code scans a month per developer. Okay. Which is great. That's a lot of code scans every day. That's a lot of code scans. <laughs> no, beyond is. code scans, I, I imagine people are probably going to like use it for PR requests or pull requests and stuff too, like to kind of validate. But can it do unit tests? And that question yeah. is from the chat. It absolutely can do unit tests. Um, I don't have a great unit test project set up here, but the unit test is just code, right? So if I yeah. tell it I want to do a unit test, it's just going to write the code to do a unit test. Now, the interesting thing about how it works today is um, that the, the requirement around unit tests is it's, again, it's about context. And right now the context is coming from the file that I'm working on. So the way to think about this is write the unit test in the same file for what you're testing. Now, a lot of people don't like that. They want the unit test to be in a separate file. So you can, you know, once you've generated the unit test, you can copy it, copy Just it out, it. move it to another file. Um, but, but that's sort of where the context is coming from today. So if I'm writing, let's say I'm going back to my, my song parser, I'm writing my song parser, then at the end of that file, I can say, okay, now I want to run a test. And it's going to then generate the code to run that test. Yeah. And, you know, before we, before we move on and like wrap things up fully, I just want to share a couple of things with you. Yeah. Comments from the chat. Tia says, did a really good, um, get a lot of good information out of this. And then our friend Darren2812, I've been watching Darren two eight one two in the chat, yes, and I feel likewise. like our, our friend has been like struggling, yep. but also watching Doug and solving his like their own problems, right? So I said it's not working. Oh, it's doing it one line at a time. Well, I'm in preview mode. Oh, I just got to hit enter. And Doug, I think that's from like your demo that you were showing us. Yeah, there's a, actually there's a couple interesting things that you bring up there. So one is. If you've been using Code Whisper in preview, please go update your IDE, go update your AWS toolkit extension so you get access to the GA version because we did update it and we did add 10 more languages. We did do some of these things. Um, the other thing is, you know, learning, learning behaviors is always a little bit of a trick where you're, you're learning that, oh, as I do things, I'm gonna see this um, you know, text show up and I'm gonna learn to hit arrow to look at those suggestions. I'm gonna learn to hit tab to accept the suggestion. There's a little bit of a learning curve that comes with that, but it comes very quickly. Most of us have experienced this in email already because email kind of does some of this and you kind of learn how to accept it. Um, and then the third thing I'll add is for the 10, for the five languages we already had in preview, um, you, you get what I kind of showed you today, which is you know, this idea that you can get a single line suggestion or maybe you get you know, 10 or 15 lines of code suggested. Um, for the 10 new languages, we are doing only single line suggestions for now. So if I'm working in Rust, I'm only going to get a suggestion one line at a time. And I'm going to kind of move through that, which is, can be a little tedious. We understand that. So we'll uh, improve that over time. But part of the reason for that it goes back to the reference tracker. We really, really want to be responsible in how we consider open source code and make sure that we're giving developers the opportunity to understand if they're getting code that looks a lot like an open source licensed project and that they understand where to find that information and that they can attribute it correctly. That's super important to us. 
And so for these new languages, we want to make sure we can do that really accurately, really well before we move into um, large block suggestions. And so um, as we do that for the different languages, they'll expand from single line completion to large block completion. Mm. To go on with that, we also had another question from the chat about, does Code Whisperer know about the rest of my project, or is it just relative to the current file that I'm editing? I was reading that one. So too, Code Whisperer yeah. really is, is the focus is on the current file you're editing. So it really knows nothing about the rest of the project. It knows the contents of the file you're editing. It knows the name of the file you're editing, and it knows where your cursor is within that file that you're editing. Um, but that will, again, that will change. We'll expand context uh, progressively as we as we work. But the security scan looked like it was it was scanning all of the files. Right? Yeah, the security yeah. scan goes across all the files. The code suggestion context is only from the current file oh, right. that you're working on. Correct. Okay. Cool. This is a cool tool. It's, so it's cool. very cool. It's very cool. I've seen One of the so things much hype did, all over social media about it. Like people are posting videos already. They're like doing tech, like you know, social media posts on their phones. I, I, I kind of gave away the actual platform a little bit, but yeah, it's okay. I'm gonna lean into yeah, that one. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that we we found that was super interesting is we we ran an internal uh, sort of study challenge, if you will, where we had a, a bunch of developers. Uh, they were sort of challenged with a task. Here's go go do this coding task, and this was something that would probably take a, a, a few hours to complete. Um, and then we sort of uh, randomly assigned half of them to get Code Whisper and half of them to not get Code Whisper. The ones that had Code Whisper, 27% more likely to complete the project successfully. In other words, they finished it and it was working and it did what it was supposed to do. Some some of the others didn't quite ever get there. Um, and of the ones who completed the project. Uh, they were 57% faster at completing the project. So almost half the time to complete the project versus the people who did not have Code Whisper, which is So amazing. the team that was using Code Whisper, they had time to finish the project and go get like gelato. Yeah, yeah. We, they, yeah they, they finished the project. We jammed out on the guitar for a little while. We <laughs> waited for the other guys to finish and catch up. It was totally fine. We got one more important question that came in on the chat. And I know you addressed this earlier, but this might be from a user who just joined us quite late on. Um, you know, about coders for using my code for training the model. So could you just re-summarize on that one? Yeah, um, let me uh, real quickly, sorry, I'm going to pull up my screen again, um, just because I want to show where to find this information. So um, I know it'd be very important you know, to some people thinking about this. Yeah. So, so again, if you're if you're using Code Whisper um, in the AWS Toolkit, there's the Code Whisper node. You can click on the gear icon, and that gives you the, the settings for Code Whisper. If you're using the individual version, in other words, you're using the free version, mm -hmm. there is an, uh, a configuration setting for share code, uh, share your content with AWS. When we talk about content, we mean um, the prompts that you're sending to Code Whisper and the suggestions that are coming back out of Code right. Whisper. Um, by, by default in the individual tier, this is checked, which means um, you're willing to share that code with us so that we can improve the model. We're gonna make it better over time based on what you're doing. If you uncheck that, we'll use the code that you send as prompts to create the inferences and create the suggestions and send them back, but then we'll forget it after that. We won't store it, we won't persist it, we won't use it to train the model. If you're using the pro version, meaning that you're using uh, Identity Center for authentication and connecting it that way, you won't even see this option because we just don't do it. We just don't, on the pro version, we just don't store the code for any service improvement. And that's one of the big differences between individual and pro. Um, they, you know, If I uncheck this, they're the same, um, but by default, it's checked. So pro version, I mean, probably is going to be more likely to be used inside organizations, right? Where they don't want to send the code out. Yeah, I think that, like what, we, what we've seen and, and what we've heard from customers that we've talked with is um, larger organizations like to have a little bit more control. Mm -hmm. um, and what they want is consistency across everybody. You know, we, we talk a lot about how um, good intentions aren't uh, a path to success, right? You have to have some mechanisms in place to make sure that things work the way you want them to work. So it's not about like control in the form of like, I'm the man and I'm putting my thumb down on you, but more like, hey, we want we have policies and we want to make sure everybody's following those policies. If, for example, by policy, we just don't want to have licensed open source code in our code base, then I want a policy where I can disable that for my entire organization. And so using the pro version, it gives me that option. And same with the sharing of code. I can certainly turn that off in the individual tier and not share that code, but by policy, that's just disabled for the pro version. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, wow. this is this is great. <laughs> thanks so much. Really great. 
about it. Yeah, it's super fun. This is super cool stuff. Yeah. Well, before we leave, is there anything you want to tell our viewers? Go run. Go, 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 go try it. Go, go to try it. go to our go to, go get the AWS toolkit. Make sure you've got the updated version. Go click on start under Code Whisper and get it going and just start using it. Um, you know, get there's lots of different uses. What's that? Get a builder ID if you don't have one. You don't need get a builder ID if you don't have one. Set up your organization if you want to do it that way, whichever it is. But start using it and start getting familiar with it. There's, like I said, there's a little bit of learning curve in terms of like, how do I express myself in a way that a generative AI can provide what I want? Uh, but that that learning curve is really short. You start to get really productive really quickly. Um, you know, the the internal study we ran is a good indicator of the kinds of success. We have customers like Accenture who who said they started using Code Whisper in some projects they had, and they saw a thirty percent uh, gain in developer productivity by using Code Whisper. So there's some great evidence out there that these tools um, really do work uh, and really do fantastic things. So go use it. That's my that's my ask of everybody. Or would you say go build? <laughs> go build exactly. Go generate. Uh, whisper. Go go with. Go suggest. Go <laughs> Doug, oh, thanks thank you so much for being Doug. here. I think um, I think you need to tell AM to start using it. I will. Really the cool. next code corner, I'll have him working with with uh, Code Whisper. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys. Sorry, Appreciate Doug. It. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Wow. That was yes. a long show today. Excellent show. I thought long, long show, but you know, there's, there's a lot of details and I, I personally had questions about like all the announcements this week, generative AI, and there's a blog post and sure I can read the blog post, but to hear it directly from the voice of the people who helped build the services and the platforms and understand it best. A lot of our chat was like asking questions and uh, mm -hmm. Darren, I've, I've lost it. Live, live while we were actually yeah. here, right? He, off to Tried it live, tried it troubleshot out. it, was still yeah. in preview mode, get that fixed. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually figured out, oh, I had to hit enter and then yeah. got it working. Yeah. That's great to watch. It's, it's so great. Yeah. And yeah. there's Darren, 2812. Hey, Darren. <laughs> well, that Did you see that comment earlier about uh, your, ha your handle, your alias? My handle. I'm envious of Bellevue, Steve. Really? Why? <laughs> it says, I assume from the username that maybe you live near some HQ. <laughs> well, I live between two big HQs. <laughs> 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 well, what's, uh, what, what were all these questions? Well, I didn't see this. Huh? <laughs> no, it's, it's oh, all right. We... <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I, I do live in Bellevue. Washington, yes. yes. <laughs> Not okay. anything, the precise location, but yes, I do live in Bellevue between two rather large HQs and probably several other slightly smaller ones. So, Awesome. And then did you see the other banner that popped up about KubeCon? I did. That's next week's show, right? Are you going to be on that one? Uh, this one, I yes. I don't believe that I am, but you never know. <laughs> and then there's the sustainability episode on the 21st, one week from today. Yep. And then the one I heard about this week, we have the Developer Innovation Day coming up. Yes. Uh, yeah. That one I am on, I believe. Um, so Is that the 20th, I believe? Um, the 26th, I think, something like that. Is it, the end of April. It, okay. Yeah, a couple of weeks, yeah. But that's, that's another free event that you can register, free online event. Um, if you go to, I think it's on the Aegis Events homepage. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, yeah, if you, if you look for that, you can register for free. There's, there's no actual registration needed. It's just an add to calendar, and you can join us on the live stream um, for an all-day live stream of, uh, well, developer innovation things. And I suspect you know we'll what? be talking um, about Code Whisperer there, too. I got it right here. Let me drop in the chat, and I'll pull oh, it up so the way everyone can see it. Yeah. yeah. Give me a second while I get that loaded up here. There we go. Someone got it for me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Great. you can register for the Developer Innovation Day. Yeah, as I say, there's, I there is no actual registration needed. If you go to that page, there's just they'll tell you right. all about it. Uh, there are keynotes. Um, Vernus. It says add to calendar. calendar. You download the calendar invite. Add to calendar. It'll add it to you to your calendar as a reminder, and then you just join us on the day. Yeah. Yeah. But you're doing that one. Uh, I believe that I am at that one. Yes, I think AM's okay. there as well. So it's going to be chaotic. Uh, FOMO. <laughs> 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 All right. 
Well, Steve, thank you so much for allowing me to co-host with you. And oh, don't worry, place. John, thank you to you. I hope you have a great weekend, all of you. And Stephanie and Brian, thank you for providing ASL to all of our viewers. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> What's the ASL for, for love? It's like this. Can I do a hug? <laughs> I wasn't too sure about the start of that with the, the with the with the one. I'm like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love. Hmm. <laughs> all right, Steve, Stephanie, all of our viewers. I hope you enjoyed the uh, extended AWS on air. Don't forget every Friday at twelve noon Pacific, we're back here twitch.tv forward slash AWS on air, and have a great weekend. Get yeah. out there and go build. Go build. See y'all. Are we are we still live? <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs>